Nella Fahidayat, the host of Dear World Live, brought to you by Doha Debates. Thank you so much for joining us for this very important discussion that we're about to have. I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but I hope you're okay wherever it is that you're watching. Welcome uh, and thank you for joining us. As ever, we tackle how the coronavirus is impacting the different aspects and lives of this new reality that we are living in. So we've had shows in the past to do with refugees, how this is uh, uh, impacting vulnerable people uh, in the disability community. And today's show uh, is a very special one indeed. Now I am here isolating in my home in London, but we're all isolating together and that counts for something. Now, I say that almost every episode of Dear World Life, isolating together. But today we're really gonna take a deep dive into what that means um, and how it actually works out in real life. We'll be thinking about the impact that the pandemic is having on the connections that we're so used to having around us and in our lives and how it's affecting the relationships we have, not only with colleagues, with friends, with family, but but all over the place. Um, and hopefully, although these connections have been disrupted in some way, and we have been asked to move a lot of them either online or just not see each other face to face, hopefully throughout this show, this episode of Dear World Live, we'll find some strategies, some insight, some useful knowledge about how to cope and to live in this new reality. Uh, of course, we are being asked to stay distant from one another, but we still need to have meaningful connections. So that's what we'll be focusing on. I wanna just make a nod to those of you who joined us on our last show on mental health and the effect of the coronavirus, what it's doing to our collective mental health, but also how it's uh, impacting people who suffer from mental health issues, be that anxiety, depression, um, or stress. And for those of you who commented, who asked your questions, Thank you. I hope we've now got back to as many of you as we can. And uh, those of you who have watched us before, welcome again. Uh, those of you watching for the first time, this is gonna be a good one. Stick around, because I can't wait to introduce my guests. But before I do that, take a look at these pictures. These images, this one showing a man in hospital um, with, a, with a doctor actually FaceTiming his family to try and maintain that connection. These two people who can't get enough of each other, I think it's a mother and a daughter, finding inventive ways to try and be close. And if not, then we're finding ingenious ways all around the world to try and be near one another. That idea of closeness, that idea of connection is something that's been disrupted heavily by the coronavirus. In fact, the World Health Organization has asked us to stop using the term social, distancing and to start thinking about physical distancing because although we are separated the world health organization would like us to stay connected in whatever new forms that will be now before i bring on my two very special very qualified guests i want to talk about a very very important guest and that's you those of you who are watching right now welcome whether it's on facebook twitter or on YouTube, you're more than welcome to be here. I want to know what you think. There is a comment bar, wherever it is that you're watching this. Send me your questions, your comments, your thoughts. How are you dealing with physical distancing the way that it is right now? And also say hello to me from wherever it is you're watching. Tell me where you are watching from and I will feature as many of your comments and your questions and your locations as I can. We've already got lots of people tuning in from all over the place. I'm very excited to have all of you here. Now, I don't wanna waste any more time. I wanna get cracking on with this. So can we please bring up Priya Parker, the acclaimed author of The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters. She's an executive producer and the host of the New York Times podcast, Together Apart. She's trained in the field of conflict resolution and has worked on race relations on American college campuses and on peace processes in the Arab world, Southern Africa and India. Gosh, that's a lot. Dr. <laughs> Govinda Clayton is also here with me. Hello, Gov. He's a senior researcher in peace processes at the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich University. Um, perhaps more importantly, importantly to me anyway, he's our connector 
at the Doha Debates, our live debate show, who tries to find common ground between our speakers who are presenting different solutions. I will also later on be joined by our two very important audience members who are joining us live. Uh, Jude Galliani is a fourth year business administration student at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. And Sharia Rana is Wal Cornell Medical College. He's a fourth year medical student and he joins us from Calgary, Canada. You are all most welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Priya, let's start with you, Priya, because um, I'm dying to understand. Those images that I showed a moment ago, the mother and daughter hugging through plastic, just trying to find a way to be close. It really gets to me every time I see those. Now, you've literally written the book on gatherings and why they're important. I want to understand a little bit about why we as human beings have that urge to be close to one another. This time is an interesting time in part because, and you've showed the photos, it's a social x-ray of what we leave for granted. Right, we we take gathering for granted, or we take being together for granted. We take being able to hug our close ones for granted. We take meeting for granted, and in part because we take it for granted, we often don't think about how to make it better. And I wrote the art of gathering because of all of the gatherings pre-pandemic that um, weren't that great. Whether it was conferences where you leave not necessarily having connected with people in a meaningful way and you see kind of panel after panel after panel or a so dinner party and you haven't actually connected with people. And so uh, one of the elements right now in this global pandemic when we can't meet is we're seeing some very interesting ways of how we actually create meaning, not just going through the motions, to actually be together when we are apart. And the podcast is our people around the country, I'm in the US, that are finding new and innovative ways to create meaning together, whether it's for a Passover Seder or Ramadan or a business meeting, even if you can't physically be in the same room. That's really interesting. So actually we're having to consider what connection and closeness means. I want to bring in Govinda at this point. Dr. Clayton, you work all over the world um, trying to help people and disparate groups resolve some really difficult and problematic issues. I mean, it's, it's conflict resolution after all. But your emphasis is on this idea of meaningful connection. So what do you mean when you say um, meaningful? And also, what has this pandemic done? to your work, to how you try to uh, resolve conflict? Sure, thanks a lot, Nell. So, I mean, to take the first part of the question, I think when we think about meaningful conversations, we think about conversations that have some kind of meaning. And what exactly that meaning is can vary in different cases. It might be to promote certain forms of well-being, or in my work a lot of the time, that refers to finding new forms of consensus and, and common ground. In terms of your second question of, of how is this current crisis influencing my work, I mean, in a lot of very serious ways. Um, so, you know, as we know, the, the devastation brought about by the current crisis, we've seen it in the West and in, and in Asia and in, um, in the US. Um, and currently in conflict affected communities, they're the least prepared for this type of health crisis. And at this moment, in which they most need the help of peace building organizations and actors on the ground, most activities completely had to pause. So high level work that's normally based around trust building and personal connections has broken down. And grass building work, so grassroots work, so for example, you just saw a photo of some of the work that I often do on the Lebanese-Syrian border, working with, with local women's groups, is all built around close personal connection and skill and trust building workshops. And this has all had to press pause when travel has not been allowed. Gosh, that, that actually sounds quite devastating because right now around the world, um, I mean, I'm privileged and lucky to be living in the United Kingdom. But if you're a citizen of Yemen, if you're a citizen of Afghanistan, of Iraq, so many places, it's, it's bad enough that you're dealing with a coronavirus. But to add war or disagreement on top of that and the fact that now these things are breaking down, it's it's incredibly difficult. I mean, how do you... Are you worried? How do you feel personally? I mean, I definitely feel very worried. I mean, we're yet to see a serious corona outbreak in one of these places like Afghanistan or Yemen, but the, the prospect is frightening. However, I mean, at the same time, I think it's also important to, 
to look for what we can learn and what we can develop. And I really want to pick up on the point that Priya made that often when things are operating as kind of business as usual, then it's too easy for us not to look for new and innovative ways of improving and developing the nature of our interactions. And because of this changing context, everybody, including myself, is having to fundamentally reinvent and rethink the ways of doing things. And as a result of that, often, of course, you can also find improvements that you perhaps wouldn't have been inspired to think of before. Absolutely. Priya, back to you really quickly. So so that's that's quite a difficult portrayal that we have of these big conversations that have basically been halted. But but what about those closer connections, that idea that at the end of the day, nothing is going to, to happen in the world unless we find meaningful connections um, themselves? Now, you have a podcast, you have um, written a book as well. If we can just talk a little bit about your work and how you try to focus on, on this idea. So I'm a conflict resolution facilitator by training, um, and my work is in group dialogue. So not necessarily conversations between two people, but between 12 people or between 200 people or between 1,000 people in the room at the same time. And one of the things that we're seeing right now is because of the global pandemic, these conversations are being paused, right? They're being interrupted. And this is happening at a macro scale that you have elections in the US, you have primaries being canceled. Um, in, in the Philippines, there are provinces that are, there's a province who's, um, uh, on May 11th, it was up to uh, citizen vote to see if it would be divided or not. That's been paused, um, which, which gives people time to think, do we want to divide this province? Do we operate it? All of these conversations are actually helping people step back and think about what is essential at this time and what do we value? And, you know, on the Together Apart podcast with the New York Times, one of the questions that we ask, we talk to teachers trying to think about how do they salvage the gatherings that, um, you know, whether in the U.S. context it's prom or graduation, um, how do they think about what do they do for their students when they can't actually all be right together and conversations so, so with that, the teacher looking at how do you actually um salvage the gatherings at the end of the year that that aren't just celebratory but look to see if students have actually learned sixth grade english writing and the juneteenth celebration that was actually the, the proof of whether or not they've learned that so how do you figure out in your community which gatherings to still do physically apart but still make meaningful Absolutely. I want to welcome Walunga Bill. I want to welcome Mustafa. I want to welcome uh, Alassane Mohammed. I want to welcome Priska. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of Dear World Live, where we are speaking to our very special guests, all about the idea of maintaining meaningful connection in time of the coronavirus. We are joined today by Priya Parker, author of The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters, and the host of the podcast, Together Apart. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher at ETH Zurich University, and of course, he's helping many of our speakers find common ground uh, as our connector on our live show, Doha Debates. I'm also joined by two active audience members, those of you who have been watching. These are the people that watch with me. They help me out in my job. I've got Jude Gelayani here with me uh, at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar, and Sharia Rana. He's at Cornell Medical College. He's a fourth year medical student, but he joins us from Canada. So let me come to you, Jude and Sharia. Jude, what are you making of the conversation you're hearing so far? I mean, I think Priya's connection is a little off, but we're, we're getting the gist of the important messages she's bringing across. Jude, to you first, what are you making of the conversation? So I think I agree on that we need to find new ways to still make connections, especially when we remember the last week's topic, which is mental health, like um, physical or social distancing does start to weigh on us. And so we need to keep going and keep connecting with the people that we care about, even if it gets hard, I think. Absolutely. And let's bring you in, Sharia. What do you, what do you think of the conversation so far? So I think it's necessary, of course. Like, I mean, we have to have some sort of semblance of normalcy going forward. But my skepticism to perhaps is that, um, uh, you know, would these be mainstays in the future once the pandemic resolves? Um, are we going to use these technologies and these means as often as we are now, uh, now that we found so much redundancies in the way that we usually communicate? 
Absolutely. So I want to bring in some uh, a comment, the, the, the comments that have been made. Lots of people who are watching right now are thanking us um, for this discussion. Remember, as ever, you can send in your questions to our guests. Are you having trouble maintaining that connection? What are you going through with physical distancing? Send me your comments to uh, write wherever it is you're watching, write it in the comments section and I'll be able to feature your questions in the show as we go along. Do it now. Uh, if we can get everyone on the screen right now, there we go, there are all my wonderful guests. I know that you guys um, uh, in Qatar and in Calgary, you both have a couple of questions. Do you want to start off, uh, Sharia? What, do you have a question for our guests? Yes, yeah, so uh, my first question is uh, perhaps a general one. I think it applies to both of you, both of our guests. Um, so considering that you know we've had so much concerns surrounding online communities and online gathering, that um, perhaps, at least when it comes to conflict resolution, uh, sending people headfirst into a balkanized, you know, self-stratified and, you know, echo chambery environments, it, you know, do you see the connections being made uh, as ones that are going to support peaceful resolution or something that's going to be a bit more problematic? So the question, just so just to be clear, so the question is, is are all the connections that are being made now online, are these all potentially like good and meaningful connections or could there potentially be some problems with them? Is that the question? Uh, well, just perhaps compare uh, the comparative between our you know normal daily interactions and those that are made primarily online. Um, is there a danger inherent in being in online communities and is perhaps this an opportunity for those to kind of flourish given the environment that we're in right now? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's, there's clearly like a fundamental difference between the, the normal everyday interactions that, that we were all very much used to before the start of this year and, and the interactions that are now taking place online. And it's something that we've all got to learn to adapt to at this period. I mean, I think coming back to the, the, the previous point that you made, an interesting question is, is which parts of this are going to stick around after this, this current crisis kind of moves into its next phase, let's say. And I think that's a really interesting question. I think both Priya and I, in our, in our initial comments, um, both pointed at the fact that the some level of innovation and change can be really meaningful. And I know for me personally, some of the connections that I've made with members of my family that I wouldn't normally talk to and new ways of, of interacting and engaging with each other have been exceptionally positive. And I hope some of those would continue in the, in the aftermath of this crisis. But of course, that's not a substitute for, for other forms of, of contact and communication that we hope will be restored sometime soon. I'd like to bring in Priya at this point because I think this is something that you work that you work with a lot. I would put to you that actually, I think the opposite, this idea of connecting online and Zooming everybody, it's just so transient, it doesn't mean anything. All you get to see is this part of me. And we know that body language is such a fundamental part of communication, right? So yeah, going to huge seminars is a waste of my time but it does mean that i accidentally bump into someone who might might have a conversation with that might lead to a project or an idea and that's what we're missing so i wonder what your take is on that this idea that trying to connect virtually is not native to our experiences and our needs I mean, I think that what is happening right now is we are all, because of the pandemic, using a technology that wasn't intended for this purpose, right? Zoom is very specifically for business meetings. And now we're using them for baby showers and for iftar, and we're using them for organized elections, right? The Supreme Court in the United States for the first time is live streaming their arguments. That's never happened before, right? How does that actually change democracy? Harvard University is systematically allowing people to defend their dissertations on Zoom, which isn't just an interesting way to be distanced. It actually changes the nature of the gathering. So 150 people in your life that don't have to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, can listen to the ideas that you've devoted to for the last six years. And so I think what you're actually seeing, whether it's good or bad, is a less interesting conversation, but actually where and how can we use these technologies to allow for access that we thought that we didn't want before or that we weren't we, we thought was too difficult before? And then also, where is Zoom not helpful or relevant that we will be uh, deeply valuing? You know, it's really hard to 
dance a hoopa, you know, or, or, or do a line dance on Zoom. And so I think what we're actually beginning to see is what is uniquely helpful in this context that we should actually begin to open up. And what are we actually uh, going to be even more grateful for and more conscious of and protect when we come back? I mean, it's not a, it's no um, a mistake that first one of the first freedoms that a, that a dictatorship um, gets rid of is the right to assemble. Right. So the right to assemble is a dangerous right, because when you assemble, you have new ideas. You can make decisions. You can plan together. You can build off of each other. And so, so part of what we're seeing is, now is, uh, you know, building his head. I beg your pardon. Um, I'm just going to go to Dr. Govinda Clayton, who's like fervently nodding his head. <laughs> Challenge accepted about the conga line on Zoom. Challenge <laughs> accepted. Um, Dr. Govinda, what about, <laughs> I, mean, I presented a, quite a pessimistic view of, of the limitations of technology, but Priya Parker says actually this offers us different types of connections that we could all be making. Any any advice on that? Yeah, actually, I, I have got some advice, but just to speak directly to Priya's point there, first of all, there was a really interesting piece written by Erica Chenoweth from Harvard, who is an expert on social movements, and she was talking a lot about what you, what you were just discussing with regards to ways of mobilizing and coming together in this time. And we've seen already in places like Israel, fundamental shifts in the nature of social movements and people getting really creative and innovative in the way in which they protest and come together. And I think that's a, that's an incredibly useful um, and interesting development we see right now. Um, I also, if I can now, I mean, I think for me, one of the most uh, interesting elements of, of conflict resolution and facilitation is how we can take processes designed for the elite level or for resolving violent civil conflict and apply them into our normal everyday lives. And, and right now, lots of people are finding themselves in situations with potentially situations at home that are a little bit more compact and, and claustrophobic than they might normally be, new business relations that are, that are occurring. And so in conflict resolution, we think about how can we design processes in order to facilitate those types of dialogue to create more meaningful and, and perhaps constructive forms of, of conflict. Like one of the things that I've put together is a series on, on better conversations. It's going to be coming out in June on YouTube, so keep an eye for that. But I'd love to hear from Priya, from her experience in, in, in designing and thinking about gatherings. What could people learn now in terms of their lives at home that can make their interactions more meaningful and creative at home? You know, I think we share this interest in the power of dialogue and conversation and creating meaning. And I think one of the things that we, that I was trained as a facilitator is that we actually focus on the wrong things when we're trying to make a gathering special. We focus on setting the table or what we're gonna cook, or what we're gonna serve. We, we over-focus and over-rely on the things and we under-focus on actually the conversation. So a couple of very simple tips. First, ask people for their stories not their opinions. People's, all of our stories are much more interesting and, and multifaceted than our, than our single opinions. And one of the things that we do in conflict resolution is we begin by asking people about their childhood, about asking them about the formative moments that shape their worldview, not so much about their worldview. And so whether it's the people you're quarantining with or whether it's or marking moments of life, whether it's birthday parties or other 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 contexts, to actually think about asking the people in your life who you think you already see in a very specific way, perhaps you actually are stuck, you have, a, you have an image stuck about them, to begin to actually ask them questions like, this is Theodore Zeldin's questions, what have you rebelled against in the past and what are you rebelling against now? How are the founding myths of your family changed the way that you viewed the world? And do you want to pass them on to your children, right? What was it like to grow up in a context where you felt different from everybody else or where you felt you were the norm, right? Questions open the world and they're not just for movies or for. Hey, when I, uh, when I, when I used to have people come around my house, I used to have a, a box of those questions with various different questions of that nature. And when people came around for a coffee, I just like pass them one at the box and they'd pick out a question. And it'd be a way of like instantly sparking a kind of meaningful conversation when normally you might connect on the weather or something like this. Jude, I want to come to you immediately because you've been sitting there pensively contemplating a lot of what our guests are saying. So just a, a word from you very quickly on, on this idea that technology should not be limiting us. They should be expanding our horizons. Are you finding that in your life personally? Um, I think I am seeing that, but I also have a question. Do you think there are ways that we can compensate for the lack of physical interaction over 
online gatherings or is that something we're just going to have to lose due to the pandemic? It's a beautiful question. I have a quick example that's a little funny, but I it, it illustrates a really powerful point. I saw a tweet the other day um, by a guy named Jimmy Riss and in it, he basically reports that, um, so there was a, he, he says, I was at a virtual Zoom hot tub party where everybody was in their own bathtub at home. No, <laughs> you see the lace on your, on to, your to have a hot tub. Priya are just so badly timed. And, and, I'm desperate to hear your stories, but unfortunately I think the connection as I'm experiencing it is, is a little delayed. But can I, can I ask you all the question that we've had coming through from our audiences who are watching online? Um, thank you, those of you who are joining us right now on Dear World Live. There's a question that comes in, um, Priya, a lot of people agreeing with you and, and are thankful for your comments, but, it, but the question is, uh, well, it's a comment more than anything. Um, looking at the trajectory of this pandemic where some nations uh, are looking into even having these lockdown measures being maintained for a while, how do we see our social relationships changing? And that's from Priya um, Pillai on YouTube. So how do we see our social relationships changing? Um, let me come to you, Priya. Let's try your connection one more time. Um, you know, we, we see studies that if uh, families or friends haven't seen each other in person they for two months, their feelings of closeness drop by 30%. If friends haven't seen each other for more than three months after that, they go frigid, right? Be in, in cycles of quarantine. And the opportunity is to actually find ways to meaningfully connect together apart as we are exploring even on this podcast so that you're you're finding new ways to actually connect. Otherwise, it is very dangerous um, to our social relationships. And so part of it is finding patterns, whether it's I know grandparents who have scheduled times with, with their grandchildren every week are more likely to actually grow a relationship over the course of these few months than those who do it haphazardly. Right. To actually think you have, we actually have to think and be strategic and intentional about who do we not just want to stay in touch with or maintain, but how do we actually want to build those relationships in isolation? When we met when we met previously, we were also distracted. Right. So how do you actually there's studies that show you should turn off the Zoom camera and just talk on the phone. People are reconnecting with old friends. Like one of the patterns that are shifting is people are actually activating their dormant ties in this period more than they have in the past but you have to be intentional. Okay, this is brilliant. And I'm, I think I'm learning a lot about using the technology that we have and using this moment to try and make different connections, not just try to recreate them. I think that's something we're all getting across. If we can just focus a little bit, Dr. Clayton, on you for a moment. Um, I wanna, with the time that we have, I wanna talk a little bit about this Britain Connects initiative that you are involved with. It's, it's, it's a, a, a program that's running across the UK, soon to be running across the UK, but hopefully it will run across Europe and who knows, the wider world. Um, I know you're super passionate about this project. Um, before I talk to you about it, I just wanna show people what it is. Start video. As Britain faces the coronavirus pandemic, people are connecting with each other in new ways. You don't want to see my great face like that was recording. Can you see me? I can see you very well, very handsome oh. you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> in May 2020, we're connecting people from up and down the country for a unique online conversation. Just you and me? It seems so. Britain Connects gives you a chance to meet someone you might never normally meet. I, I've been nursing for 56 years. Oh really? My mum's in there. My mum's in the health service. You can find out what others are going through. I volunteered to go back to the front line and I've been working in the intensive care unit uh, in Sheffield. And even help someone feel less lonely. I've never had the best mental health. I was an introvert. It doesn't feel safe anymore. Salute you and for that. Uh, that will be the hardest thing in the world. I'm itching to go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> we were thrown together, but I'm so pleased we were. <laughs> Stay in and meet someone different. Sign up at BritainConnects.co.uk.
the reason I love that is because it just it brings back that serendipity that randomness that life affords us when we're able to go out and about but we're able to find new ways of innovating and finding those connections so i'm i every time i watch that i get a little tear in my eye but it's really important to you govinda so tell me a bit about it why did you want to get involved in this initiative sure so i mean it's a good example of how things have evolved and developed and grown in relation to the crisis so me and some colleagues were originally discussing this, this plan and I had a very small role in, in the original project that was attempting to bring people together across the political divide, so people who had different political opinions on issues like political parties, Brexit, um, feminism, and encourage them to have a conversation. Because there's really good psychology research that suggests that when you have contact with people with, with which you have different opinions, then there's some kind of moderating effect and you come closer together. And, while in the process of developing this type of this, this program, obviously the coronavirus came came about, and so we had to think, well, how can we evolve and develop this project into something different? And so, what you what you've just seen the the trailer for there is the Bring Connect project. So the idea is to bring people together from all across the UK who have different positions, different understandings, and positions on political issues to have a conversation. And so, for me, you know, my whole my whole focus in life is about promoting conversations, in particular between people that have differences of opinion. So. I'm really delighted to be playing a small role in the project. And if you're based in the UK, please go to bringconnect.co.uk, sign up, and we'll match you with someone for, I'm sure, a fantastic conversation. I love it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I just want to bring in Priya just very quickly one more time. There you are. Um, you have, you studied in MIT, Harvard, all these places, places where um, great ideas come about because people come together, right? Um, how do you think this is going to affect learning. Um, that, that process that Jude and Sharia are going through right now, this idea that learning is being kind of taken off of this social space, this, this gathering space. Um, I think it's really dangerous. And I think that as we reemerge and different countries will be doing it at different times in the US, different states will be doing it at different times and we don't know what's coming in the next two years. I think that it's imperative that universities and, and institutions of education really think about not just how do we teach children information, but how do we actually improve their social emotional learning? How do we design for their interconnectedness? interconnectedness? If we know that it takes 50 hours to move from an acquaintance to, an, to a friend, how do colleges begin thinking about designing the social and the dorm time, not just remote learning? I, and, and at least in this country, particularly high private schools and institutions of education are in crisis because we're finally detangling the financial structure of these institutions from what they're called to teach. And uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. Absolutely true. Okay, this is the part of the show, if we can have everyone up on the screen together, where we have our call to action, or at least we have our very useful tip bit. So as the lockdown, and a lot of you, especially you, uh, Jude, um, and uh, uh, I think Dr. Clayton, pretty much everyone has alluded to this. When things change, as lockdowns in various countries ease and we're allowed to go outside a little bit more and interact with one a little bit more, how can we do so in a meaningful way? What is the new no normal going to be in the post-corona world? I want useful, helpful tips uh, from you guys about how we can try and connect with one another in the post-corona world. Let's start with you, Priya, and we'll go in a round robin. Um, the first is to not try to replicate the form of your offline gathering and take it online to actually ask first, what is the purpose? Why do I want to mark my birthday this year? What is it in my life that I most want my friends or family to help me with? Um, the second, as I said before, is to ask and invite stories over opinions. And then the third goes to Jude's question earlier, which is think about how you can bring in the physical even into your Zoom gatherings, whether it's if you're cooking to to both smell and you know you're having a shared sensorial experience um, and using the actual worlds behind you in the center of your gathering not just trying to block them out i love that that's brilliant dr clayton sure i mean i would say two things like one get curious and start listening 
I mean, in terms of building meaningful conversations and connections with people, like listening is your superpower. So to get out there, start listening, start asking meaningful questions, just get really curious. It's impossible to be closed-minded and curious at the same time. So get curious about your friends, get curious about your family, get curious about everyone in your social network and see if you can't understand where they're at and find areas for some real meaningful connections. Jude, I'm curious as to see what you're going to say. What do you think? Post-corona world, what tip can you offer? Um, I think adding on to what Priya said earlier, we need to appreciate the things that we used to take for granted. Um, when we're able to see our friends and loved ones again, we need to appreciate that even if we can't really live the normal that we used to when it comes to physical connection, let's say. And very quickly from you, Sharia. Well, I mean, this environment's a great place to uh, meet new friends and, um, you know, reinvite others who were, you know, not so close to the past to be part of your um, uh, part of your social community, really. And uh, basically, finding new ways to interact uh, online, like, like there's uh, specific op opportunities online that you could use. Um, video gaming, in my case, um, or finding a shared goal in an organization. Um, uh, altruism is probably one of the better keys that we have in, the, in this environment, right? We want a sense of agency over the pandemic. Um, and there's many organizations online that are very helpful, very um, understanding, and they invite people to join them. And um, that, that's kind of, those are the beneficial things that I've seen in my experience. Parker, Dr. Govinda Clayton, Jude Giliani, and uh, Sharia Rana, thank you so much for joining me for this very helpful debate. Say goodbye to our audience. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. I want to take a moment to read some of your amazing comments that I haven't managed to get to so far. So let me just have a quick look here. Amazing comment sent here from Alice M. Key. Alice says, I think during this quarantine, people are able to connect more often through technological devices like me. She says, I've been having meaningful conversations with friends and family than before. So Alice certainly is trying to make the best out of a very difficult uh, situation. There was a comment here, I think from William, who we didn't get to um, per se, but I hope it was addressed when Dr. Govinda was last speaking. William says, how does someone who al already has social issues become because of autism spectrum disorder? How do they have these meaningful conversations? It's a really, really interesting point, but I don't know if you saw in that Better Connections video, there are ways to do that if you participate in different sort of group activities and initiatives that are running. That might be one for you, William. To, to do. Um, lots of other comments and questions coming in. Thank you to all of you who have been watching this episode of Dear World Live. I'm so thankful for your time. Listen, if you want more from us and if you want to see past uh, shows, then you can just go right here. That's it. Look, I even know where to point. DohaDebates.com forward slash live. You can see our previous discussions. They are wonderful. So much to learn, so much to absorb. And if you've got a few hours during quarantine, why not get on there and, and let it play? Watch it. Let, let Absorb it um, if you can. If you're out and about going on your daily exercise, whether it's to the park or for a walk anywhere, why don't you listen to this? Yeah. It's course correction. This is a podcast series brought to you by Doha Debates with me, Nelifa Hidayat. There are 18 episodes of course correction right now for you to be able to binge on. Each episode sees me challenge myself to tackle a huge global issue like our plastic waste problem, like having difficult conversations. And I do it in a very personal way. There's a lot going on in there. And in fact, tomorrow, is the grand finale. The last episode of Course Correction will drop Wednesday and it will be uh, an amazing conversation that I've had, in fact, with Dr. Govinda Clayton, who you've just seen. So if you want more from him and you want more from us and you want more from me, please download and stream Course Correction right now. I look forward to seeing you um, uh, there. Now, just before I go very quickly, if you want to be in a future episode of Dear World Live, if you want to be on screen right now, you can do so. Just get in touch with us. We are connect at dohadebates.com. So you can just send us a wee little email and we'll get back to you. I'd love to have you on my show. It will be great. 
that's all from me for this week. I'll see you next week on Dear World Live. <laughs>